give her like maybe like a piece of fruit or a piece of like vegetable, a chicken or something that we know she would want and that she normally would like try to pull off like part of your fingers right. for. And it just became like a little like, uh, uh, and you saw that there was a struggle and that she just couldn't physically open her mouth. Okay. So the first patient we saw today was Zoe, a seven-year-old English bulldog that presented for inability or difficulty opening the mouth. Uh, the owners had noticed that uh, she didn't want to play with her toys as much. She'd go up to her toy, uh, but wouldn't pick it up. And when we were eating food, um, we just weren't eating with as much uh, gusto as we normally would. So um, we went to our veterinarian and our veterinarian was concerned about inability to open the mouth. Actually, even under sedation, they were unable to open the mouth. So that makes us worry about trismus or what trismus is, is um, inability to open the mouth. There are a handful of causes uh, of trismus, including things like masticatory muscle myositis, um, trauma to the, to the jaw, um, and other abnormalities of the jaw that make it unable to be opened. The most common thing that we see is masticatory muscle myositis. Masticatory muscle myositis is inflammation of the muscles of chewing. Um, it's typically autoimmune in origin, meaning the body's immune system or body's defenses attack itself. Diagnosis is by doing a blood test called a 2M antibody. So basically it checks for the body's immune response against those muscles. Sometimes we need to do an MRI. Sometimes we need to do a muscle biopsy in order to confirm that. But the 2M antibody, the blood test, is a good way of screening for it. We leaned towards just doing that today just because right now we really can't open uh, her mouth very well and for muscle biopsies and MRIs we typically need to anesthetize dogs so since we couldn't open the mouth it would probably be hard to um, perform anesthesia safely. So today we sent off the blood test for the 2M antibody and started her on steroids. Most dogs respond to medications um, and prognosis can be favorable. Sometimes dogs do have relapses, so we're going to monitor her closely as we slowly decrease the medications. Last Sunday, not this Sunday, the Sunday, the Sunday that passed, he was panting very hard and the eyes like, to me the left side of the face looked more crunched in. Okay. Um, and then now his eyes and his ears was pulled back like this and a lot of lines with okay. a lot of tension up here. And that, the entire face has relaxed more as the week has gone on. When he does have the episodes, he still moves like the neck moves. That's more relaxed. Um, he never cried when we touched him in so you're saying that more, area. D during the episode, he'll still move his head around. Still moves his head, yeah. Okay. What? So the second patient of today was Bruno. Bruno is a five-year-old French bulldog that came to us to be evaluated for these episodes. For the last week and a half, he's been having episodes where he'll stop, he'll stare, he won't want to lift his head, and he's having spasms within the neck. He wasn't screaming or crying in pain, um, but the owners did feel that he was painful. They took him to his veterinarian who prescribed some pain medications, and he did all right, but was still having episodes of pain. So he presented to us for evaluation of these episodes. On his examination today, he seemed very, very normal. He was moving his head around, he seemed comfortable, um, but they brought some videos and the videos suggested neck pain. In the videos, Bruno sort of pacing around the house, seeming anxious, holding his head low, and then they also had a second video that was showing the spasms in the neck. So we talked about the possible causes of pain, uh, including a slipped disc, um, meningitis, tumors, malformation, and infection. And we talked about if it's a slipped disc, that sometimes it can get better on its own without surgery. The owners were concerned for other causes, such as meningitis and tumors, so we decided to proceed with an MRI to find out what the underlying cause was. Luckily, we found a slipped disc. So that's the best thing in that with surgery, I have about 98% chances of fixing it. But the plan for right now is since his exam was normal today, he's only on a couple medications 
and they weren't yet strictly resting him, that we're going to institute strict crate rest and add a couple other pain medications. Most dogs that are going to respond to this are going to do so within a week. So we're going to re-examine him in about a week and if he's doing well then, we'll continue with medications and rest. If he's not doing well, or obviously if he gets worse at any point over that time, we will do surgery and there will be about 98% chances of us fixing him. The next patient of the day was Hendrix. Hendrix is a young French bulldog that presented to us for episodes of trembling in the rear limbs and crying in pain. So when the owner would pick him up, he would cry out. Um, when the, his primary care veterinarian uh, examined him, he seemed painful. But then starting today, he started having abnormal eye movements, what we call nystagmus. So nystagmus suggests a problem with the balance system. And we characterize nystagmus in a couple different ways. One, in which direction the fast phase is. So most nystagmus kind of has a slow direction and then a fast jerk in the opposite direction. So we characterize um, which direction it is. Is it going up and down, meaning vertical, or side to side, horizontal, or is it more rotary? Um, the rest of his neurological examination, uh, his level of consciousness, his reflexes, the rest of his cranial nerves, and his knowledge of where his feet are, called his postural reactions, were all normal. So we localized him as peripheral vestibular. There are two parts of the vestibular system. The peripheral vestibular system, which is the inner ear, and the central vestibular system, which is the brainstem. Um, so his examination was most suggestive of a peripheral vestibular problem. The one thing that concerned me was that he was also acting painful. So sometimes we see that with meningitis where we can have rear limb weakness or we can have a problem suggesting a back problem and then pain and then something like vestibular disease, so a multifocal localization. Um, so we were concerned that this was going to be something like meningitis or encephalitis. Our strong recommendation was to perform an MRI, and on MRI, we actually found a deep ear infection, what we call otitis media interna, and it's also spread outside of the bulla and into the surrounding muscles. So sometimes that can be very, very painful. So of all the things that we were thinking for, um, for, for, for that could be causing the problems, um, this is the best thing that, that we could have found. So we're looking at Hendrix's MRI here. In this pane in the upper left here, we're looking at Hendrix in profile. So this is his nose, his forehead, the top of his head, the back of his head. This is his brain. If we think of Hendrix as a loaf of bread and we make slices, that's what these other three pictures are. These three are all the exact same slice made right here. So this slice is what's called a T2 weighted image, this is a T1 weighted image, and this is a fat sat T1 weighted image after contrast. So looking at the upper right pane here, the T2 weighted image, it's a slice made right where this green line is. And as I scroll back, the first thing that we see is the muscles on the left side of the head are bright. And as we scroll further back to the level of the tympanic bulla, or the middle ear, we can see that there's this white material within the tympanic bulla that we do not see on the other side. The other side is full of air. If we look at the T1 weighted image, that same left tympanic bulla is full of material, whereas the right is not. Moving back to the upper right pane, we can see that all of the muscles ventral or below the tympanic bulla on the left are just bright and, um, and, and inflamed and swollen. So looking or comparing these two images, the T1 weighted and the T1 post contrast, we can see prior to contrast the um, muscles are uh, iso intense to the brain and this material within the bulla is mostly iso intense and um, maybe even just a little bit darker ventrally here. Um, but after we give contrast agent, the periphery of the bulla or of the material in the bulla 
strongly contrast enhance, and all of the muscles ventral or below the bulla are very strongly contrast enhancing. So this is the classic appearance of otitis media interna, um, but this particular infection looks like it is broken out of the tympanic bulla and into the surrounding tissues around the tympanic bulla. There was no evidence of it actually spreading into the brain. We did a spinal tap as well, um, and there was no evidence of meningitis. So treatment involves antibiotics, um, ideally based on culture and sensitivity. Uh, this is a dog that would likely benefit from either a deep ear flush or even surgery to remove the infection from the ear called a total ear canal ablation and bulla osteotomy.